Is life a game of inches? As Al Pacino passionately explains in the film Any Given Sunday. What would happen if we just made that train? Or if we missed that train? That's a pretty finite measurement, one inch. Should I go to the high side? Or should I take the low lane? Richard Petty always talked about circumstances. Could an inch be associated with that? An evangelist, once in giving a message about prayer, said, Just imagine what could have happened to you today. Yes, what could have happened to us today? Sure, we could drive ourselves crazy with what-ifs in this crazy game of our life's inches or circumstances. But here we're going to look at one driver's breakout race on a national stage, the situations leading up to it, the circumstances during it, and the results following it. We don't think of Louisiana as a hotbed of stock car racing. Sure, IMCA came in and ran their Pelican 200 for years, but Lee Petty took home that lone NASCAR race in Shreveport in 1953. Skip Manning was making a name for himself out of the tiny little town of Bogalusa on the border of Mississippi, driving super modifieds, finding his love of vehicles from his dad, Frank, also called Skip, when he gave him his first motorbike. Aside from a stint in the Army in Vietnam, where he was in charge of a fleet of vehicles, which he said he and others raced on weekends on a makeshift track, Skip, that nickname, came from a letter his dad wrote asking how the skipper was doing, competed at places like Oswego, Jackson, up in Michigan, Indiana, and that super modified. But that was about to change. Billy Hagen of Lafayette, Louisiana, owned a drilling business called Stratigraph. But he also loved racing, competing in ARCA, MUSAC, IMSA, and the NASCAR Grand Touring Series starting in the late 1960s. But now, Hagen wanted to own a car and NASCAR Cup, and Skip was his driver. Their first race in that car, bought from A.J. Foyt, was in March of 1975 at Atlanta. And as Skip recalls, we pulled into the pits in a pickup truck towing the car. I see all these giant trucks and diesels hauling Petty and Pearson. I would have liked to crawl into a hole. But we finished 12th, and that was my biggest thrill. Here I was racing with all the drivers I had always heard about. After five races that season, their best result was on 11th in the 1975 Southern 500. So what next? I run at the 1976 Cup Rookie of the Year title. In those five races, as Skip said, those were just to get my feet wet. And in an early 1976 battle with Terry Bivens, Things got a little shaky, but Skip appeared to be on his way late in the season, until the Southern 500, when he lost an engine and spun in his own oil. And Joe Frisson couldn't miss him. It trapped Skip in the car for over an hour, but he was extradited and back in the seat the next weekend. He pieced together rides with the 92 on it and took that Rookie of the Year honor. Goal set and reached. Skip Manning, the 1976 NASCAR Grand National Cup Rookie of the Year. The only thing I regret is that my father never lived long enough to see me race. I think he would have been really proud. Named Frank after his dad, he died when Skip was only 17. Entering 1977, the team brought on board veteran crew chief Daryl Bryant, he has good knowledge of the engine and chassis of the car. That means I don't have to go out there and handle a lot of wrenches and turn a lot of nuts and bolts before I get to race. Daryl frees me to concentrate on some other things which are just as important to this operation. With Daryl here, I'm more relaxed and feel like I can do a better job when it comes to driving. At the time, Skip was the only driver in the field with a college education. He graduated from Southeastern Louisiana University with a degree in business administration. Many times I've thought that I wasted all those years on college until I got into this business. When you realize you are managing a team that operates on a $100,000 plus a year budget with three full-time employees, a business degree really comes in handy. 
now with 1977 looming, Skip said, coming off my rookie year, I feel like it's important that we prove we were able to run up front with the best of them, or it could have been easy for a lot of people to start calling us strokers. I think if everything continues to progress at the rate it's going now, I'll be looked at as one of the top people in the circuit. Feeling they upgraded their equipment, Skip was looking forward to a big season. However, only five top fives were produced heading into the August race at Talladega. Could a sophomore jinx be happening? August 8, 1977. Talladega, Super Speedway, or as it was known, the Alabama International Motor Speedway. James Hilton and Dick Brooks had pulled off upsets. Why not another? Skip said it, referring to practice, we actually were able to pull away from these guys this morning. That indicates to me that we're as strong as the front runners, and I should be able to stay up with them the entire day. He qualified sixth at 190.435, but Benny Parsons was on the pole at 192 miles an hour. But Skip was starting in front of drivers like Petty, Baker, Bobby Allison, Daryl Waltrip, and David Pearson, among others. Leave it to Talladega, though, to come up with some odd circumstances before the green flag, as five hot dog teams got caught with oversized fuel cells. Manning's not one of them. The green flag waved, and Benny jumped out to a lead, but Sam Summers took the point at lap two. Donnie Allison, Kiel Yarbrough, Petty, and Richard Childress all led at least one lap, while Benny took the point for 28 straight laps before lap 40. Manning said, Talladega excites me. It's got to excite the people. My adrenaline really gets to flowing when I think of racing there. It's a track where every driver knows he has a chance to win. The draft plays such an important factor, and you know if you're still running when the last 100 miles rolls around that you can win. That really gets you pumped up. Skip's strategy was simple. Take it easy, not putting a lot of unnecessary strain on the car in the early going. We wanted to stay close to the front without pushing the car to the limit. I had a little bit of overheating problems early, but was able to pull out of the draft and cool the engine down. In one of the more bizarre instances of the day, Cuckoo Marlin lost a drive shaft, which shot through Bobby Allison's car and lodged in Janet Guthrie's fuel cell. There were no injuries, but that could have been big. Benny Parsons, the dominant car, dropped out before lap 100 with engine failure. David Pearson was off the pace, as was Richard Petty with a burned valve. However, Donnie Allison was still in the running, and Skip Manning took the lead for the first time at lap 140, only to lose it to Allison the next time by. However, a strange incident happened with about 25 laps to go when Allison jumped out of his car and Darrell Waltrip took over in relief. During that pit stop, Donnie felt ill when he consumed something that made his stomach sick. So Darrell jumped in the car, and the ironic part is he replaced Donnie at Die Guard two years prior. Anyhow, Skip was now in the lead, and would hold it until lap 172. With Cal Yarbrough's car stuck in high gear, it was now a two-horse race, Darrell Waltrip and Skip Manning. Darrell led laps 173 through 175. Skip was out front at 176 until 177. Then Darrell paced lap 178 through 179. Skip took it back at 180. Darrell took it back at 181, and Skip took it back at 182. But then the unthinkable happened. At first I thought the motor had blown, so I backed off, said Manning. Later we thought it was an oil line that had come off, but eventually we learned it was a burnt valve. Still, Skip finished third, Darrell Waltrip crossed the line first, and Donnie Allison had his eighth win. If he keeps it up like this, he'll win a lot of them, said the winner. Skip said, I'm still learning, and that's how you do it. 
you get up front and run with those guys. Of the car Manning drove to third place, Darrell Waltrip said, that's the sorriest piece of junk I've ever driven, considering the Stratograph team bought many chassis off the Die Guard outfit. Now I have three full-time men and an experienced crew. This season, we've only had one engine failure in nine races. I've got a lot more experience. I'm a threat now. I'm not the fastest car out there, but I'm usually in the top 10 fastest. If we keep finishing in the top 10, the day will come when we'll slowly be knocking on the door to some wins. If Donnie does not exit the car and then have it go on to win the race, by far the number one story from the 1977 Talladega 500 is all Skip Manning. We ran third, which was good for us, but those five laps probably cost me $200,000. I missed out on the winner's circle, a NASCAR bonus plan for winners of the previous season, which is worth $150,000, another $14,000 in prize money, and I don't think I would have had any trouble securing a 20-race sponsor if I had won. So it was an easy $200,000. All that was running through my head while it was happening. Everyone figured Manning was going to be a front runner, and he did have decent finishes in the rest of 1977. However, 1978 was the same old story. Manning, his wife Gloria, and his brother Ronnie were trying to run the team with limited funds. During the middle of the season, it was rumored that Stratograph was going out of business. And then the word was coming down that it would be a two-car operation. However, a young crew member named Terry Labonte was placed into the seat right before the Southern 500, finished fourth, and Manning was out. Manning finished out 1978 doing a one-off for Robert G., Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s grandfather, and Blackie Wangerin. Each year, the cost of operating a team with a realistic chance of winning had increased drastically, he said. I wish I'd have gotten here earlier into Cup, like a 24 or 25. I think I could have advanced quicker. Sometimes I think the time I spent in college helped me in some ways, but if I could go back and do things again, I believe I would spend those four years of college pursuing my career in Grand National Racing. Still having a corner of Robert G.'s shop, Manning attempted to find funding to keep going in Cup. He felt he still had some talent and still had something to offer. However, at the 1979 Daytona 500, for the second year in a row, he and Bruce Hill collided, and second year in a row, Manning was taken out of the race. He started one more event for Hamby in the 17 car at Charlotte, and that was it for him and Cup. He returned home to race late models, such as Five Flags, Mobile, and places like that, here racing with Jody Ridley and speaking with Bill Elliott. Billy Hagan made the choice to replace Skip Manning with Terry Labonte, and we all know what their game of inches became, winning the 1980 Southern 500 and the 1984 Cup Championship. Billy Hagan passed away in 2007, but Stratograph is still going strong, run now by his son William. I spoke to Frank W. recently about his choices in life, and he said, I retired from driving in 1982. We were winning. We had the best cars. We had the best motors. But I just got tired of trying to pay for it all. I opened a used car lot and made some money. My wife and I never had kids, so we're able to travel. We go to classic car shows. We're into motorcycles. We've settled down. I'm basically retired. I tinker here. I tinker there. I've had a blessed life. I'm a Christian, and I wouldn't change a thing. My biggest regret professionally, though, is we weren't able to win a race. But that's okay. I have no complaints. It's been a good life. But just imagine, just imagine, just imagine how Skip Manning's life could have been different had he won that day in Talladega.